that if there's no purpose, you have nothing to fulfill, you can just live. Hmm? No, but you want a purpose. So these people do not have a particular purpose in life at all. They don't have a purpose for existence. And they live the same way as the animals, drink, sleep, rest and procreate. See, if you had a purpose and if you fulfilled it, after that what would you do? After that what would you do? Bored, isn't it? And they assume that the full world has come into existence by chance. And we human beings too, we have come into being by chance. So when you have a God-given purpose, life here becomes less important than your purpose. And because they don't have a purpose, they try and strive excellence in eating, in drinking, in living, and they become materialistic. And that's the reason for such people, materialism becomes their god. Yes or no? You're mistaking the ambience for the real thing. No. Life is important because it's the only thing you know. You don't know anything else. Do you know something else? And Allah gives the reply in Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2. Allah says, Allah zi khalakal mawta wal hayata. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. Allah has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 185, Allah says, Kullu nafsin Every soul shall have a taste of death. But the final recompense will be on the day of judgment. And anyone who has been saved from the fire and enters the garden, he would have achieved the objective of this world. For this world is nothing but mere chattels of deception. Isn't it fantastic that if there's no purpose, you have nothing to fulfill, you can just live? Hmm? No, but you want a purpose and not a simple purpose, you want a God-given purpose. <laughs> it's very dangerous. People who think they have a God-given purpose are doing the cruelest things on the planet. Yes or no? They are doing the most horrible things and they've always been doing the most horrible things. Because when you have a God-given purpose, life here becomes less important than your purpose. No, life is important. Life is important. When I say life, I am not talking about your family, your work, what you do, what you do not do, your party. I'm not talking about that as life. This is life, isn't it? Life is within you or around you. The… the ambience of life, you're mistaking the ambience of life for life. Your home, your family, your workspace, your party, this is all ambience of life. This is not life, isn't it? Yes or no? You're mistaking the ambience for the real thing, no. Life is important because it's the only thing you know, you don't know anything else. Do you know something else? Rest is all imagined stuff, isn't it? The only thing is that this is beating and alive and that's all there is. So is this important? It is of paramount importance. Not you as a person, that's not important. But you as a piece of life, it's very important because that is the basis of everything. When I say that is the basis of everything, the universe exists for you only because you are, isn't it? Yes or no? The world exists for you only because you are, otherwise it wouldn't exist in your experience. So, in every way this is important. So what is the purpose for this? See, if you had a purpose and if you fulfilled it, after that what would you do? After that what would you do? Bored, isn't it? 
It is just that life is so intricate and so phenomenally intricate that if you spend a ten thousand years looking at it carefully, you still will not know it entirely. If you spend a million years looking at it with absolute focus, still you will not know it in its entirety. That's how it is. There is… is there a meaning to it? The greatest thing about life is that there is no meaning to it. This is the greatest aspect of life, that it has no meaning to it and there is no need for it to have a meaning. It is the pettiness of one's mind that it is seek a meaning, because psychologically you will feel kind of unconnected with life if you don't have a purpose and a meaning. People are constantly trying to create these false purposes. Now, they were quite fine and happy, suddenly they got married, now the purpose is the other person. Then they have children, now they become miserable with each other. Now the whole purpose that I go through all this misery is because of the children. Like this it goes on. These are things that you are causing and holding these as purposes of life. And is there a God-given purpose? What if God does not know you exist? No, I'm just asking by chance <laughs> I'm saying in this huge cosmos for which God is supposed to be the creator and the manager of this hundred billion galaxies, in that this tiny little planet and you, suppose he doesn't know that you exist, <laughs> what to do? <laughs> possible or no? I'm sorry, I'm saying such sacrilegious things, but is it possible or no? What if he doesn't know that you exist? What if he doesn't have a plan for you? <laughs> suppose he doesn't have a plan for you, an individual plan for you, don't look for such things. The thing is, the creation is made in such a way that creation and creator cannot be separated. Here you are a piece of creation, at the same time the source of creation is throbbing within you. The topic of this evening's talk is the purpose of creation. This question, what is the purpose of creation arises in the mind of every individual sometime or the other, irrespective whether he's rich or poor, king or pauper, black or white, yellow or brown, whether he lives in America or UK, whether he lives in India or Saudi Arabia. This question sometime or the other crops up in the mind of each and every individual. Why have we been created? Why are we here? What is our purpose in this world? And most of the human beings, they think that there has to be a supreme creator, that is Almighty God, and because of Him we are here. However, there is a minority who do not believe in the existence of the Creator, of Almighty God, and they assume that the full world has come into existence by chance. And we human beings too, we have come into being by chance. Suppose you see on the beach the footprints of a human being. Immediately, a logical person, he thinks that these footprints have been created by the walking of a person. A logical person will not assume that the footprints came into existence by chance or the footprints came into existence by the waves coming on the beach and when the waves went away, it created these footprints. A logical person will realize that these footprints have been created by a person. It had a purpose why it was created. This question, what is the purpose of creation? 
can be answered in two perspectives. Number one, from the perspective of the creator, that is almighty God. And second, by the perspective of the creation, that is human being. The first perspective is the view of the creator almighty God. What caused him to create the human being? What caused him to create this creation? And number two, from the perspective of the creation, that the human beings, that why were we created by Almighty God? Those people who do not agree in the existence of Almighty God and believe that we have come in this world by mere chance, according to this philosophy, there is no difference between the human beings and all the other creation. All have come by chance, even the human beings as well as the animals. So these people do not have a particular purpose in life at all. They don't have a purpose for existence. And they live the same way as the animals. Drink, sleep, rest and procreate. That's it. So the purpose of the animals and the human beings become the same. To eat, to drink, to rest, to sleep and to procreate. And because they don't have a purpose, they try and strive excellence in eating, in drinking, in living, and they become materialistic. And that's the reason for such people, materialism becomes their God. And because of this, the same people, they create drugs just to earn money, to have a better living. They create bombs and weapons of mass destruction. They involve in fornication, in adultery, in homosexuality, in pornography. It doesn't make a difference to them whether they make drugs or whether they involve themselves in pornography. The main purpose is just nothing but materialism. Let us discuss today the answer to this question, what is the purpose of creation from both point of view? First, we'll discuss from the creator's point of view, from the point of view of Almighty God, from the point of view of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what caused him to create the human beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Ghafir, chapter number 40, verse number 57, that the creation of the heavens and the earth are far greater than the creation of the human beings. But most of the human beings here, they realize it not. Many human beings feel that we are the greatest of the creation. But Allah says, that the creation of the heaven and the earth is far greater than the creation of the human beings. And in reply to this query, that why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why Almighty God created us? One of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, is the creator, the best creator. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 14, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, is the best to create. If there is a creator, if his attribute is creator, there has to be a creation. If there's no creation, then there cannot be a creator. For example, if you call a person as the best writer, but naturally you'll ask him that where is the material you have written? Where is the book you have written? Where is the article you have written? So when he presents the article or the book, then we can say, fine, he is the best writer. Similarly, since one of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator, the best creator, he has to have a creation. But that does not mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is dependent on his creation. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 62, that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who creates everything and he is independent of all his creation. He is not dependent on these things, but the creations are dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Arabic word for create is khalik, and to create, the Arabic word is khalaka. Khalaka can be divided into two types. One meaning of khalak is to create something from something, which besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even we human beings and other creations can do. For example, a carpenter who creates a chair and a table, 
with the help of wood and nails. But the wood has been obtained from the trees, which has not been created by the carpenter, not by human beings, but by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The nails have been obtained from metal, which have been obtained from rock, which again is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all the creations done by human beings, they're dependent on basic elements, all of which have been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this type of creation, to create something from something, is a limited type of creation. The ultimate and the true creation is to create something from nothing. And this, no one besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do. To create something from nothing. This is the ultimate creation, which none of the creation can do except the uncreated Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the creator of all the creation. Since his attribute is the creator, there has to be creation. There are various attributes given in the Quran. For example, he's called as Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Ar-Ghafir, the merciful, the kind, the forgiver. The creation of the human beings is a unique creation. We human beings, we have a free will of our own. We can either obey our Creator Almighty God or we can disobey. It is a unique creation. And because we have this ability to either obey or disobey our Creator, we can even sin. We can sin. And only because the human beings can sin, can the quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being the forgiver, being kind, being merciful, can be known. If human beings, if we did not have a free will, and if we had followed everything what Allah has commanded, there would be no difference between us and the angels. The angels are a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who do not have a free will of their own. They obey each and every commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they don't have a free will of their own. But the human beings have a free will. And because of this free will, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the kindness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be known. The other attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is given in the Quran is loving. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in several places in the Quran that he loves those people who trust in him, those people who are patient, those who are righteous, those who are pious, those who are patient and perseverance, those who approach him and those who trust in him. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 31, He tells to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, He tells him, that tell, that if you love Allah, follow me, and Allah will love you and forgive your sins. The Prophet has been commanded by the Creator Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to tell the people that if you love Allah, you have to follow me, that is follow the Prophet. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love you and he will forgive your sins. And there's a hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in Tirmidhi and has been authenticated as Sahih by Sheikh Nasr al-Dalmani in his Sahih Tirmidhi, hadith number 3540, where a beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says that if you ask Allah, Allah says, if you approach to me, I will answer you. And if you ask for forgiveness, I will forgive you. Even if your sins reach up to the cloud, I will forgive you. Even if your sins are as big as the complete earth, I will approach you in the same way with forgiveness as long as you ask for forgiveness and do not associate partners with me. That means whatever sin you do, as long as you ask for forgiveness with sincere repentance, if you do not associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't do shirk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will forgive you. One of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the grace. And the beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number four, hadith number 6765, where the Prophet said that do the right things, do the best deeds to the best of your ability and be happy. Do the right things to the best of your ability and be happy. For no one can enter Jannah only on the basis of his deeds. So one of the sahabas asked that, what about you, Rasulullah? So the Prophet said, not even I. I cannot enter Jannah unless with the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his grace. 
unless his grace and mercy and his forgiveness envelop me, I cannot enter Jannah. So here we realize that without the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no one can enter Jannah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 160, Allah says that if you do any good deeds, I will multiply it 10 times into your account. And if you do any evil deed, I will only count it as once. For Allah, he does not do anything wrong. So here we realize that if any good deed you do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, he will multiply it minimum 10 times into your account. If you do any evil deed, he'll count as one. That means if everyone was accounted one point for his good deed and one point for his evil deed, without multiplication of the good deeds, not a single human being would have entered Jannah. It is the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he multiplies your good deeds and gives you multiple times more reward that you shall go to Jannah. That does not mean that deeds aren't important. Deeds are very important. But the grace is more important. Without the grace of Allah, you cannot enter Jannah. Allah multiplies, but your deeds also should be there. If your deeds are there, don't even multiply. If your deeds are zero, and if you multiply with even a million times, it will be useless. So deeds are also important, but without the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no human being can enter paradise. So because of his quality attribute, of being merciful, kind, forgiving, loving, and grace. All these are manifested in the Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the attributes is also supreme justice. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has a gap. Before a person is born, he knows that after a person is born, whether he'll do good deeds or bad deeds, whether he'll listen to the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or will disobey, he knows. He even knows whether the person will go to Jahannam or Jannah, whether he'll go to hell or paradise, he knows. But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the moment a person is born, or before he's born, he puts him in heaven, person who deserves heaven, and puts the person in hell who deserves hell, the people who have been put in heaven, they may not object. They may say, fine, alhamdulillah, we have been put into heaven, no problem. But surely those people who have been put in hell, they will object. That how come you haven't let us lead our life, and without a test, you have put us in hell. So because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never unjust in the least degree. That's the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets the people live in this world. And if you follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you pass the test, otherwise you fail the test. And people may ask that one of the pillars of Iman, the last pillar, is Qadr, is destiny. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Sajda, chapter number 32, verse number 12, Allah says, all these people who will go to hell, on the day of judgment, they will never object to the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will say, all these sinners, they will bow their head down and say, please forgive us. They will agree with the Lord. They will say, please give us one more chance so that we can go again in the world. And that time we will surely be believers. But Allah knows that even if he forgives them and puts them back into this world, but natural, he'll have to wash out their memory of what they've seen of the hell. Allah is sure that they'll again commit the same mistake. And this is mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Anam, chapter number six. Verse number 28, that if these people were again sent in the world, they would repeat the same mistakes because they are liars. So Allah knows in his divine wisdom that these people, even if he sends them again, if the memory is washed out or what they've seen of the hell, they will do the same mistakes. But coming to the question of Qadr, Qadr is the sixth pillar of Iman, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we Muslims believe, that Allah writes the Qadr, He writes the destiny. And people may object. Many people ask this question, Muslims and non-Muslims alike, that if everything Allah has written in the destiny, that fine, whether this person is going to do good or bad, whether they're going to commit a murder, or whether they're going to commit a rape, or whether they're going to rob, or whether they're going to do good deeds, whether they're going to go to hell or heaven, if everything is mentioned, then where is our choice? Who's to blame? 
if I commit a murder, Allah wrote in the Qadr, I'm going to commit a murder, and I commit a murder. Who's to blame? Allah is to blame. So why should I be put in hell? And this is a very logical question. The reply to this question is that we have to understand the concept of Qadr and destiny. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has destined things where a person is going to be born, in which condition he'll be born, when will he die, which land will he die. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Isra chapter 17 verse number 14 that whenever a child is born, the fatir is bound on his neck. The moment he's born, Allah knows everything what he's going to do. Good or bad, right or wrong, whether he's going to go to hell or heaven. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ilm gab. I'll give you an example. There's suppose in a class, there's a teacher who teaches about 100 students for about one year. And before the examination, that teacher predicts that this student, he will come out first in class. First class first. This student, he'll get second class. That student will fail. Just an example. Don't feel bad, brother. Now, after a few days, the examination takes place, and this student comes out first class first, this student gets second class, and that student fails. Now, I'm asking you a question. Can the student who failed, can you object to the teacher that because you predicted I'm going to fail, I have failed, who's to blame, the teacher or the student? Who's to blame? The student. The teacher predicted this student, he plays hooky, he doesn't attend class, he sees movie, therefore he's going to fail. That student is OK, average. That student is very intelligent does good, hard work. So teacher predicts in advance before the examination, this student will get a first class first, this student second class, that student will fail, and the student comes out first class first, second class, that student fails. But because the teacher predicted, that does not mean the teacher is to blame. The teacher has taught everyone correctly and equally. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ilm gab. He has knowledge of the future. Certain things they are destined he has said that okay, this person will be born in this land on this particular date, he'll die in this land in this particular date, etc. His surrounding, he'll be wealthy or whatever it is. But the choice is yours. For example, after you pass your 12th standard, you have a choice of becoming an engineer or becoming a doctor or becoming a lawyer. The choice is yours. You choose to become an engineer. So Allah already knows in advance that after you pass your standard 12th, you will choose to become an engineer. He's written in advance. It is not because Allah has written that you are choosing. It is because you have chosen, Allah has written in advance. The choice is yours. But Allah knows your choice. For example, if you come at a crossroad, and there are five roads, road number one, two, three, four, five, the choice is yours. You can either take road number one, two, three, four, five. You choose road two. It's already mentioned in advance in your destiny that you will choose road two. It is not because Allah is writing that you're choosing. It is because you will be choosing that Allah has written in advance. So the choice is yours. You have a choice to earn your living, whether with good deeds, halal way, or with robbing, haram ways. The choice is yours. Now you rob. The choice was yours. But Allah knows in advance that this person, he would want easy money and he will rob. So Allah has written in advance that this particular person at the age of 25, he will rob. Who's to blame? You are to blame. But because Allah has written a gap, he has written in advance. The choice is yours. Allah has given us human beings free will. You cannot blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your misdeeds. If you go to hell, it is because of your misdeeds. And if you go to Jannah, it is because of the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now let's try and answer this question. The purpose of creation from a different angle, from the angle of the creation, from the angle, from the perspective of the human being. That why have the human beings been created by Almighty God? And the reply to this question is given in the Quran, in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 172 and verse number 173. Allah says that He brought out from the loins of Adam's children, may peace be upon him, all the descendants, and ask them that, am I your Lord? And all said, we testify that you are our Lord. And Allah continues, lest on the day of judgment, they will say, we were unaware that you are our Lord. Or lest they may say that our ancestors, 
they worship somebody else they did shirk they associated partners and we just followed them so they are the liars we should not be blamed so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before the human beings came in this world allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought all the human beings from the loins of the children of adam and asked them who is the lord and all of them testified that there's one allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is our lord and now is our test in this world allah says in the quran and i started my talk by quoting the verse of the quran from surah dhariyat chapter number 51 Verse number fifty-six. Allah says that we have created the jinn and the men not but to worship me. Wa ma khalaqtul jinna wal insa illa liyabudun. That we have created the jinn and the men not but to worship me. The purpose of creation of the human beings and the jinn is to worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Now this word worship, if you analyze this English word. it is derived from the old english we or skype which means to honor and if you read the new living webster's encyclopedic dictionary it says that worship means act of devotion honoring the deity devotional acts honoring the deity and if you translate into arabic the arabic word is ibadah mama khalaqtu al-jinna wal insa illa liya'budun the arabic word for worship is ibada it is derived from the root word abd which means a slave and it is the duty of the slave to be obedient to all the wills and wishes of the master so ibada means total submission to the will of the creator allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ibada means total submission to the will and wishes of the creator allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and further if we analyze that even one of the forms of worship as mentioned in the english dictionary is glorification as allah says in the quran in surah an-nasr chapter number 110 verse number 3 allah says iza ja nasrullah wal fath waraitan nas yadkhuluna fi din la faja fasabbi bihamdi rabbika wastaghfir innahu kana tawwaba that means glorify the praises of the lord glorify the praises of the lord so one form of worship is glorification of the creator of allah subhanahu wa taala and one may ask that why does allah subhanahu wa taala require the human beings to glorify him is allah subhanahu wa taala dependent on the praises of the human beings see irrespective if all the human beings praise allah subhanahu wa taala it will not make him superior and if not a single human being praise him yet it will not diminish him he is the same whether you say allah wa akbar a thousand times or million times it will not make allah greater or if you don't say allah wa akbar also it will not make him less he is the greatest he will remain the greatest and allah says in the quran in surah fatir chapter 35 verse 15 that allah subhanahu wa taala doesn't require the human beings It is we who require him. It is the human beings who require him, and he is worthy of all praises. The Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala does not require his creation. It is the creation who require Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and he is worthy of all praises. So the question is, why does he require us to praise him? The reason is, it is for our own benefit, because it is a human tendency that if we praise a person, if a person is famous, we tend. to follow his advice for example if your mother is suffering from a heart problem and there are two options the one option who you have is the best doctor in the world number one very famous everyone knows him number one other person is just a plain mbbs doctor and you have the option of going to any of them both are giving free treatment who will you go to but naturally you go to the one who is very famous number one in the world the heart specialist and whatever advice he gives you because he is world famous and you even acknowledge him to be the greatest among all the doctors you will follow his advice that is the reason when we praise allah subhanahu wa taala and call him he is the greatest he is the most merciful he is the most kind the moment we praise him whatever advice he has given us in the last and final revelation the glorious quran or whatever advice he has given us through his messengers and the last and final messenger prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam we will follow it So the reason we praise him is not for the benefit of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. He does not require praises. It is for our own benefit. The moment we praise him, 
Oh, he's the greatest. He's the most wise. Okay, he's telling you not to have alcohol. Then you stop having alcohol. The moment you agree that he's the most wise, he's the greatest, he's the most merciful, immediately whatever advice he gives you, it is human tendency, we follow the advice of the person who's the greatest. So that's the reason we praise him for our own benefit. And that's the reason. Allah SWT says in the Quran, in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 14, that verily, I am Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I am Allah, and there's no God besides me. So remember me regularly and offer prayer regularly. Allah is guiding. But offer prayer regularly. Because today in the world there are so many evils, so many distractions, we tend to deviate. This salah is a sort of programming towards righteousness. This form of worship is a programming towards righteousness. We are getting programmed. As the doctor says that for a healthy body, you require minimum three meals a day. So, for a pure soul, for a healthy soul, you require minimum five times Allah. So, all forms of worship are benefit for us. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 183, that fasting has been prescribed to you as it was prescribed to those who came before you so that you may learn self-restraint. Why do we fast? So that we learn self-restraint. And today, the psychology they tell us that if you can control your hunger, you can control almost all your desires. So when we fast, we abstain from food, drink, from dawn to sunset. If we can control our hunger, we can control almost all your desires. So by fasting, we are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But who's benefiting? Not Allah. We are benefiting. We are learning to control our desires. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90. Ya ayyu al amnu, O you who believe, inna mal khamru wal maisuru most certainly intoxicants and gambling were anzabul azamu dedication of stones divination of arrows rich summon amili shaitan these are satan's handiwork first anibul alakum tuflihun abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper here we are being guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that oh you believe most certainly intoxicants gambling dedication of stones that's idol worship divination of arrows that's fortune telling these are satan's handiwork abstain from it that you may prosper and Allah says in the next verse in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 91, that Satan, he creates enmity and hatred between the human beings through intoxicants and gambling. And this takes you away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is guiding you. When you offer salah or when you read the Quran, that's a form of worship. When you offer salah, form of worship, you are getting guided. That steer away from intoxicants, from gambling. It is the Satan who uses this to create enmity between the human beings. And this will take you away from remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All forms of worship, any act, any commandment that you follow of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a form of worship. Any commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a human being follows, it's a form of worship. As long as you do it in the right way. There are two things, there are two criteria required. Number one is that you should do it only for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not for your own glorification or praising your own self. Any act you do, you should do it for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever Allah commands you, do it for His pleasure, not for glorification, not for praise, not for becoming famous. Criteria number one. Criteria number two, that it should be done the way Allah and His Messenger have commanded you. Whatever Allah has asked you, do it the way Allah has asked you to do or the way his messenger has asked you to do. If you do it in any other way, that's not called worship. So do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, follow his commandments and the commandment of the Prophet. But the way Allah and his Prophet have told you. If you do it any other way, then it is not correct. And it's mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu in Sahih Muslim, verb number two, Hadith number 1885, where the Prophet Muhammad said that the worst of all the affairs is innovation in the religion, innovation in deen. It is a curse, and the innovation in the deen will take you to hellfire. It means the worst of all the affairs is bidah in deen, innovation in deen. And this is a curse and will take you towards hellfire. So, whatever you do, worship, there's a general rule that all types of worship is prohibited except 
the type which is mentioned in the Quran and the Sahih Hadith, the type which has been mentioned by Allah and His Rasul. Any other type of worship is prohibited. It is forbidden except that type of worship which has been described in the Quran and described in the Sahih Hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So further, if we analyze that the purpose of the creation of the human being is to worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and when we worship Him, we benefit. It helps us. And there's a misconception that Islam is a new religion which came into existence 1400 years ago. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the founder of this religion of Islam. In fact, Islam is there since time immemorial, since man set foot on this earth. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the founder of this religion. He is the last and final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There were several messengers that came, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fatir, chapter 35, verse 24, wa immin ummatin illa khalafiya nazir. There is not a nation or a tribe to whom we have not sent a warner or a guide. Allah says in Surah Rad, chapter number 13, verse number 7, wa likul niqam in had. And to every people has a warner been sent. There are more than 25 messengers mentioned by name in the Quran. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. All of them were messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of them, they were Muslims. Muslim is a person who submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Islam is a word which comes from the root word salam, which means peace, or from salima or silm, which means to submit your will to Almighty God. So Islam, in short, means peace acquired by submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Almighty God, the Creator. All the messengers, they brought the same message. And anyone who submits his will to the Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is called as a Muslim. Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 52, that Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was a Muslim. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 67, that Abraham was not a Jew or a Christian, but he was a Muslim. And since our Creator is one, humankind is one, even the religion should be one. That is the reason Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, Inna dina in the la islam the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is Islam, which is peace acquired by submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah repeats the message in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 85, that if anyone desires any other religion besides Islam, it will never be accepted of him. And in the Akhirah, he will be among the losers. Since our Creator is one, humankind is one, the religion is also one, and all the prophets teach the same message of submitting your will to Almighty God, worshipping Him alone and no one else. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Bayyana, chapter number 98, verse number 7, that those who have faith and do righteous deeds, they are the best of creation. Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the human beings the best of creation. The greatest, there are many greater creation like the heaven, the earth, but the best of creation is the human being because we have a free will. And if with that free will, we obey the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we reach the best of creation, highest. We are better even than the angels because angels don't have a free will. Human beings have a free will and then if you obey the commandment, we become superior to the angels. But if you don't obey his commandments, we become the brothers of the Satan. So the human beings, are the best creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the gravest sin that is described in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 48, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive any sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he pleases, he will forgive any sin. But the sin of shirk, he'll never forgive. Allah repeats the message in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 116, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he pleases, he will forgive any sin. But the sin of associating partners with him, he shall never forgive. The greatest sin for the human being is associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worshipping anyone besides the one true God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is love. And as I mentioned, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loves his creation. And because he loves us, 
with his grace, he has given us all this niyama. All the niyama that is given us, the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, all the facilities that Allah has given us because he loves us. And those who obey his commandments, he has prepared a place for us in paradise, in the next life also. This is because of his love. The beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number one, hadith number 67, that that person has tasted the sweetness of the faith. Those who do three things. Number one, those who love, those who love Allah and his messenger more than everyone in the world. Number two, those who love human beings or those who love people for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number three, those who hate to go back to disbelief from where Allah saved them and they don't want to go to the hellfire. So these people who do these three things, according to the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they have tasted the true sweetness of faith. And as Allah mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number three, verse number 31, the Prophet is commanded to say that all those who love Allah, follow me. For Allah will love you and Allah will forgive you. Now if we analyze that we human beings, we too love the other human beings. We love our parents, our father and mother. We love our wives. We love our children. And the reason we love them basically is because these people, these human beings, have done certain favor on us. For example, we love our mother because she bore us in a womb for nine months. She took care of us in childhood. She brought us up. We love our brothers. Either they have given us something or we want something from them. We love the human beings. So in that context, if we calculate the favors Allah has done on us, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 34, that if you count the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will not be able to add them up. So imagine if we love our parents for the few things they have given us, how much should we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the love differs. We human beings, we may love animals. We love human beings also. But the love of the animals that the human beings have is different on a different level as compared to the love that we have for the human beings. Similarly, the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is on a different level as compared to the love we have for the human beings. It is far superior. It is far more on a higher plateau. It is mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Fatiha, chapter number one, verse number five. Iyaka na abdu wa iyaka na stain. They alone we worship, they alone we ask for help. We have to only worship him and no one else. Allah says in Surah Ghafir, chapter number 40, verse number 60. You ask me and I will answer your prayer. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 186. O Messenger, when they ask you about me, tell them I am near to them and I will answer their prayers. So all worship should only be done to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. He is the only one who deserves the worship and no one else. Now let us analyze the purpose of creation from another perspective, from the perspective of the human beings, that what is the purpose of existence in this world? God created us. We came in this world. What is our requirement? What is our purpose of existence? And Allah gives the reply. In Surah Mulk, chapter number 67, verse number 2, Allah says, Allazi khalaqal mawta wal hayata. It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. Allah has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 185, Allah says, Kullu nafsin Every soul shall have a taste of death. But the final recompense will be on the day of judgment. And anyone who has been saved from the fire and enters the garden, he would have achieved the objective of this world. For this world is nothing but mere chattels of deception. That means this life of ours in this world is a test for the hereafter. If we obey the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the next life, we'll get paradise. If we don't obey, we will not get paradise, we'll go to hell. So this life, 
the purpose of existence, as Allah says, is the test for the hereafter. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah An Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 2, that do you think just by saying we believe, we will let you go? We will surely test you. I Means if you just say, I believe in Allah, I am a Muslim, I am a Mormon, do you think Allah will let you go? Finish your test is over. Allah says, don't you think we will test you? Just by saying I am a Muslim, just by saying you are a believer, just by saying I submit my will to Almighty God, you will not go scot-free. Allah will surely test you. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 155, that surely we will test you with fear and hunger, with loss of your lives and of the goods and what you've accumulated in your life and give glad tidings to those who are patient. Allah says he'll test everyone either with fear or with hunger or with loss of life or with goods or the wealth they've accumulated. Allah will test you. And Allah tests different people in different ways. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 165, Allah says that he has given more sustenance to some of the human beings over the other. With some of the human beings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given more sustenance as compared to the other. Allah says this in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 71, that he has favored some of the human beings over others in sustenance. Allah repeats this message in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 165, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given more gifts to some of the individuals and based on what he has given you, he will test you. Now there's a question that people ask that how can Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be just that some people are born in a poor family, some people are born in a rich family, some people are born healthy, some people are born with diseases. It is unjust. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unjust. How can he make the differentiation between different human beings? We come to know that this world has life and death. There is health and disease. There is wealth and poverty. All these are tests. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 28, Allah says that surely your wealth and your progeny, your children, are a test for you. And Allah says in chapter number 63, verse number 9, that let not the wealth and your children deviate you from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests different people in different way. One of the tests, one of the best deeds you ask anyone, that what are the good deeds? And the good deeds that all human beings, whether they believe in God or not, they will say, the good deeds are charity, it is contentment, charity will be there amongst the few that he names. So how can Almighty God test whether some people are charitable or not? If all the people have the same wealth, then where is the question of the test? The test will only take place if some people are poor and some people are rich. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests people in different ways. Maybe some people are born in a rich family, they have a lot of wealth. Some people are born poor. But the person who is rich, according to the Islamic Sharia, one of the pillars of Islam is zakat. That's every rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that saving every lunar year in charity. The person may be a millionaire, may be a billionaire. He may give the required amount, then he will get passing marks. He may not give the complete amount, he may give portion, small portion, maybe 20% of what is required to give, a part of what is required to give. He will fail. Some people may not give zakat at all. Absolutely fail. The poor person, he does not have to give zakat at all, he gets full marks. But we humanly, we say, oh, bichara admi, poor man, you know, so much problems he has in his life. And we look up to the person who's rich. Our beloved prophet said that it is more difficult for a rich man to enter Jannah than a poor man. But as the Quran says in Surah Anfal, chapter 8, verse 28, that the wealth is a test for you. It's a test. We are fools that we think, okay, you know, ah, this person is rich. Allah has blessed him. It's a test. If he doesn't use the blessing which Allah has given him, it's a blessing. But the chances of him failing the test is very high. 
For example, in one of the question papers, which came last year, or two years before, in 2002, a very difficult question came. And most of the students could not apply. Next year, that question does not appear. It would be foolish for us to say, oh, how sad this question did not come. You should be happy. It did not come. So wealth is the test. So those people who don't have wealth, it is actually easier for them to go to Jannah than a rich man. So Allah tests different people in different ways. Therefore, Allah says that let not your wealth deviate you from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a test for him. The other test, it is contentment. It's contentment. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, worm number eight, hadith number 447. The Prophet said that even if a person owns a valley of gold, he would want to have another. Even if a person owns a valley of gold, he would want to own another valley of gold. And the maximum he can take in his mouth is the dirt of the grave. Before, however rich he is, let him be the richest man in the world. The person would want to crave for more wealth. A person is not content. Most of the human beings aren't content. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 32, that do not ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that which Allah has favored other people. We say, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have given him so much wealth, you have given him such a good, beautiful car. Don't ask from Allah what Allah has favored others with. It will be lost for you. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number four. Our beloved Prophet said that look at those people who are less fortunate than you. Don't look at those people who are more fortunate than you, lest it will divert you from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lest you may be ungrateful to your Lord. So Prophet said, look at those who are less fortunate. Then you say, okay, fine. The person, you know, he doesn't have a car. At least I have a small car, Maruti car. Don't look at a person having a Mercedes. Oh, why don't I have a Mercedes? The person doesn't have a car. At least Allah has given me a car. You'll be thankful to Allah. The moment you compare yourself with the person who has a Mercedes, oh, why hasn't Allah given me a Mercedes? So look at those people who are less fortunate. It will help you to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is human nature. And there's a the saying that there was a man who complained because he had no shoes until he saw a man who had no feet. A person used to complain, I've got no shoes. Complain to Allah, I've got no shoes. Until he saw a man who had no feet, then he's thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least I have feet. So contentment is a test. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number eight, that the real wealth is contentment, it is not property. The real true wealth is contentment, being satisfied. Whatever you have, you say, Alhamdulillah. Praise be to Allah. That is the true movement. That's a true believer. That's a true Muslim. Contentment. While well, people ask, that how come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created some people who are born healthy? He makes some people born healthy. Some people are born with diseases. Maybe congenital disease, heart disease. Some are born handicapped. So is Allah unjust? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never unjust in the least degree. This is a test. Allah tests different people in different ways. Maybe it's possible the children that are born, they are masoom, they are sinless. It's not their fault at all. But as the Quran says in Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 28, that your wealth and your children are a test for you. And Allah repeats the message in chapter 63, verse number 9. That do not let your wealth and your children deviate from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it may be possible that it's a test for the parents. It's a test for the parents. There may be occasion, whenever any calamity comes on any individual, it is either a test or it's a punishment. Those people who have deviated from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for them it's a punishment. From those who are on the true path, it's a test for them. Maybe the parents are very good Muslims, offering five times Salah, may have given the zakat, may have gone for hajj, may be fasting the month of Ramadan. Now Allah gives them a child who has congenital heart disease. The true Muslim, a true woman will say, Alhamdulillah, thank you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is testing them. A person 
who's ungrateful or may not be able to pass the difficult test, will say, oh, why? He will start cribbing. He'll complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why did Allah give me a child who's handicapped, who has congenital heart disease? And more difficult the test, more high is the reward. More difficult is the test, more high is the reward. For example, if you sit for a BA degree examination, if you pass, you're a graduate. BA, graduate in arts. But if you pass an MBBS examination, besides being a graduate, you get a doctor in front of your name, doctor. But to pass an MBBS examination is multiple times more difficult than to pass a BA examination. So more difficult the test, more high is the reward. So maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give those parents not Jannah, but Jannat Firdos. So even though they're pious, Allah wants to give them a higher reward. And that is the reason our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sunnah Tirmidhi, when a person asked, that who had the maximum test in this world? The Prophet replied, that all the Anbiyas, all the Prophets of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, they had the most difficult test. After that, those who were closest to them, those who were like the Prophets. After that, those who were like them. And more higher is the faith of a person, more difficult is the test. I mean, most taqwa a person has, Allah gives you a difficult test. See, you took admission into MBBS because you got high marks in 12th standard. Hi? So more difficult test. To pass MBBS is difficult. So here also, the prophets, their taqwa level cannot be compared with the normal human beings. So just because they were prophets of God, even the prophets were tested. No prophet was just led without testing. But because the taqwa was high, the prophets were tested multiple times more than the normal human being like, compared to you and me. More difficult. So more higher is your taqwa and the faith, Allah will test you. So true believer, if difficulty comes, he says, Ah, subhanallah, praise be to Allah, alhamdulillah. He takes it as a test. Any calamity comes, it's either a test or a punishment. For the prophets of high taqwa, it wasn't a punishment, it was a test. And they passed the test. When any good things happen to an individual, it's either a reward or a test. Wealth can be a reward or it can be a test for you. Any good thing happens, it is either a reward or a test for you. For those who have deviated from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they pray, give me wealth, Allah gives them wealth and tells them and they fail. So in this world, they get what they want, luxury, but in the akhirah, it's nothing but loss. Charity is a test, contentment is a test. Your children are a test. Many times, we human beings, we complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why doesn't Allah answer our prayer? Allah says in the Quran, you ask me and I will answer your prayer. But here I am praying every day, Allah is not answering. It sounds a bit contradictory. Allah says, you pray to me and I answer your prayer. But we find many times we pray, but nothing happens. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 216, you may like a thing which is not good for you. And you may hate a thing which is good for you. You know not, but Allah knows. For example, there is a young boy, about 20 years old. He's praying, Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give me a BMW. I don't know if you are aware of BMW. BMW motorcycle. I want a BMW motorcycle. Very fast motorcycle, praying. Praying, praying, prayer is not answered. Maybe Allah knows that if Allah would have given him a motorcycle, he would have had an accident and he would have fractured his leg. He would have become handicapped. So, actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by not answering his prayer, he's answering his prayer. By not answering his prayer, Allah is answering his prayer. By not giving him a motorcycle because he's a good banda, he's a good person. He's asking for things which is not good for him. I know, he doesn't know. So Allah doesn't give. So by not answering, Allah is answering. And many a time people, like Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 15 and 16 about the hypocrites, he says that Allah gives them rope so that they go to and fro. You ask wealth, Allah gives them wealth. There are many people who associate partners with Allah, they ask, I want wealth, Allah gives them wealth. It is nothing but a test for them and they are digging their own graves. So we should never despair. Allah is there. Always have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the reason suicide is haram in the Quran. It's mentioned in Surah Nisa chapter 4. That kill not yourself. Kill not yourself because Allah is most forgiving. He is there. If you have faith in him, the moment a person commits suicide, 
It is as though he is ungrateful. He says, Almighty God has given me so much trouble. He is unjust. It's not worth living and ends his life. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 286, which is the last verse of Surah Baqarah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not lay a burden on anyone greater than what he can bear. Allah does not lay a burden on anyone greater than what he can bear. This is the first part of the verse. The next part of the verse continues, and then we make a dua. Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lay not on us a burden greater than we can bear. In the first part of the verse, when Allah has already promised that he will not lay a burden greater than what we can bear, then why do we have to pray, O oh Lord, lay not on us a burden greater than we can bear? Because why? We dig our own grave. We lay a burden greater than what we can bear. We are the cause. We ask, give me wealth. Allah gives wealth. <laughs> so we are praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make not us the cause to lay a burden on ourselves greater than we can bear. So we should always have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And worship him alone. He is the creator. Our purpose of existence is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no one else. This life is a test for the hereafter. Obey his commandments and be satisfied. Whatever test he gives you, a true moment is thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Normally we complain, we don't have this, we don't have this. The most important thing for living is what? Someone tells food, someone says water. Most important is air. If you don't have air, for a few minutes you will die. How many of us have we ever thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Thank you for the air you have given us. How many of us have done that? How many of us do we realize? Free, free me milta to kya? We should reflect on the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all the niyama he has given us. Now coming to the last perspective. That why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create this world? What is the purpose of this world? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 32 and 33, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the heaven and the earth and let water come from the sky. With it, he has given fruits. He has caused the ship to sail with the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has called rivers to flow for the human beings. He has made the sun and the moon for you. He has made the night and the day for you. So all these creation in the world are for the human beings. The full world Allah has created is for the human beings. And it is our duty that we have to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all these ni'amah. And besides thanking, it's our duty that we take care of these things. That's the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created animals. But killing animals, it is prohibited. Killing animals is prohibited. It's mentioned hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They do not kill animals for target practice. Yes, for food amongst the halal animal which Allah has given permission, that you can have. With the way Allah has showed you and the Prophet has showed us. But for target practice, and we find many people, they want to conquer these ni'amah. They do target practice and they want to put the head of the animal in the drawing room. Allah has created the mountains. We want to conquer the mountains, go on Mount Everest. How many people die every year in trying to climb the Mount Everest? We want to conquer it. We want to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the ni'amah. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, the camels have been created for you to carry load. But even though they have been created for you, we have to love them, we have to respect them. There are several Sahih Hadith, several. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, that there's a person who gave water to a thirsty dog by going in the well, by carrying the water in the socks. And because of that, he was gone to Jannah. There's another hadith in Sahih Bukhari, volume number four, that there was a prostitute. Just because she gave water to a thirsty dog, she was gone to Jannah. And the Sahaba asked, that, do we get reward even for giving water to a dog? He said, yes, why not? Imagine the animal which is prohibited to come in our house. Even if we give water to that animal, Allah will reward you for that. And there's a hadith that once an old lady, she tied a cat and did not give it food. So Allah put her in hell, that why did she and did not give her food? At least she should have let it go free. She would have fed on the rodents. And that poster is there in one of the posters that is in the exhibition. So we have to even love and take care of the animals. Even the vegetations, we can eat them for a requirement, but not unnecessary kill the plants. Even in war, 
Our Prophet Muhammad said, they do not chop down trees, do not burn the crops. So all these are the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Adiyat, chapter number 100, Allah says, Allah takes an oath of the steeds of war. The horses that run for war. Allah is taking oath and saying, Allah continues, verse number 1, 2, 3, 4. Allah says that these horses, sparks come out of their hooves. Clouds of dust they raise. They enter the enemy. Describing that Allah is taking an oath of these horses, the steeds of war. They are without any fear. Just because their master commands them, the person who is a horse rider. For the sake of the master, they enter into the enemy. There are swords, there are weapons. Irrespective whether the weapons, the steed keeps on going because he wants to obey the master. Allah is taking oath of this force. And in the ending he says, but man is ungrateful. That means the horse, to obey the master, it is ready to die. It is ready to get itself killed. Just because the master says go, it goes. Whether there's an enemy, whether there's a sword, whether there's a weapon, whether they're going towards the death, because of the master. But human beings are very ungrateful. That's the reason, it's the duty of every human being to reflect on the purpose of creation. That why have we been created? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's the creator. He's merciful, He's kind, He's forgiving, He's just. It's the duty of every human being that you should worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Worship Him and no one else. And this life, you have to remember, is a test for the hereafter. If we follow his commandments, we shall go to Jannah. If we don't, we shall fail this test and go to Jahannam. And we have to take care of the niyama Allah has given us. I'd like to end my talk by giving the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 110, which says, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhridat nas. O ye Muslims, ye are the best of people evolved for mankind. We are called as khaira ummah, the best of people. Whenever there is honor, it is always for the responsibility. There is no honor without responsibility. The responsibility is mentioned in the same verse. And Allah continues, Ta'miruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna anil munkar. Wa tu'minuna billah. Because we enjoin what is good, and we forbid what is wrong, and we believe in Allah. It's the duty of every Muslim that whatever he knows, if you know the purpose of creation, you have to tell it to the others. By what we created, we should worship no one but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This life is the test for the hereafter. Invite people to the truth, exhort them to the truth. Ta'miruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna in munkar. And enjoin them towards the good and prevent them from going towards the wrong. It's the duty of every Muslim. Dawa is compulsory. If we do not enjoin what is good and we do not prevent people from going towards the wrong, we aren't fit to be called as Muslims. We aren't fit to be called as khaira ummah, the best of people. I would like to end my talk with the quotation of the Quran from Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 125. He says, Udu ila sabili hasna, wajadun hasan. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Wa akhru dawana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.